Welcome to the Truth Pulpit with Don Green, founding pastor of Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hello again, I'm Bill Wright. It is our joy to continue our commitment to teaching God's people God's Word. Today, Don is continuing with the second part of a message we started last time. So let's get right to it. Open your Bible as we join Don now in the Truth Pulpit. Well, what can, we, what can we say by response to this biblically? Point number two tonight, a biblical response on Mary. A biblical response on Mary. And by the way, if, <laughs> if there's any chance that on subsequent media a Catholic friend has listened this far, uh, I'm grateful for that. And let me just say to any Catholic that would come under the sound of my voice, we say these things out of love to, for the good of your soul to help you understand that you have, you have been deceived by a very powerful system, a powerful earthly system with spiritual influences that are, that are not good, that are evil and demonic. And we say these things plainly so that you could see the truth and come out of that system and come to the true Lord Jesus Christ who alone can save you. It's for the sake of your soul in part that we do this. We are not your enemy simply by, because we have told you the truth. We would be your enemy if we called you a brother or sister in Christ when we know that that's not true. We cannot participate in the deception that has already been played out upon your soul. God help you and God help us. Point number two, a biblical response on Mary. The Catholic view of Mary has rightly been called Mariolatry. They give her honor that goes to God alone. It is the worst of sins. And let me just remind you of the first of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, where God said, you shall have no other gods before me. This is Exodus chapter 20. Now we're in the Bible, okay? Now we're into something that we can believe and trust and give our souls over to. Now we can relax in a sense and say, I don't have to have my guard up because the Word of God is true. And as we read the words of Scripture, we are given the truth of God that guides us. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5 says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters in Christ, God does not treat lightly this elevation that the Catholic Church gives to Mary. He does not tolerate competitors. He does not share his glory with others. And this is, this is ultimately why Mariolatry is the greatest of sins is because it is an affront to a holy God who is jealous for his own glory. And it robs him of that. It turns attention from the one who truly is high and exalted to a figment of demonic imagination. Now, with that said, as a framing thought, there are two passages from the Gospel of Luke that can orient you toward right thinking. And I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8 now. The Gospel of Luke chapter 8. And here's what I want you to see. Catholics, Catholics have this distorted idea that Jesus is remote and unapproachable. But he'll listen to his mother. And so you go to Mary and ask Mary to go to Jesus so that Jesus, man, Jesus won't say no to his mother. Well, that's, that, that, that's such a reproach on the name of Christ who said, I am gentle and humble in heart. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Under what kind of false assault on the glory of Christ is he described as someone who is remote and unapproachable? 
Far to the contrary, Christ, Christ approached man when he left heaven and came to earth. Christ approached man in his suffering on the cross that man might be reconciled to a holy God. No, 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 no. Never will we accept an accusation against our Christ that he is remote and unapproachable and unwilling to hear the prayers of those who approach him. The truth is the exact opposite. Jesus Christ is the friend of sinners, not Mary. And Christ, out of his own gracious character, will gladly receive your prayers. Christ, out of his own gracious character, my unsaved friend, will hear you and respond when you call upon him for salvation. Because the Bible says, whoever calls upon him will be saved, Romans 10, 13. What did Jesus think about Mary in his earthly ministry? Luke chapter 8, verse 19. Remember all of this, all of this supposed elevation of Mary in Catholic teaching. Did Jesus adopt that? Did Jesus point people in that direction during his earthly ministry? No, 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 no. He didn't. Luke chapter 8, verse 19. His mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you, appealing to the family relationship as if Jesus needed to respond to that. Remember, this is his mother and his brothers, which we'll have more to say about in a moment. Jesus said, but he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. He said, the one who has a real relationship with me is the one who by faith believes the word of God and obeys it. That's who my family is. And he diminished the physical, biological connection and put things on a spiritual plane directly tied to the revealed written word of God. Look at Luke chapter 11. Verse 27, Luke 11, verse 27, in one of my prior Bibles that I have had since worn out, I had written in the margin of this passage, Jesus rebukes the first Roman Catholic, and that's the case. Although the woman wasn't a Roman Catholic, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Luke 11, verse 27 While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. This is an incipient, a beginning budding form of the adoration of Mary. Catholics would say that in a heartbeat. Blessed is the womb of Mary. Blessed are the breasts which nursed the Messiah. What does Jesus say in verse 28? He'd have, he had none of it. He would have nothing to do with it. He said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. You see the theme? He rejects any association of elevating his mother. And he says, the ones who are blessed are the ones who hear the word of God and do it, who observe it. The ones who receive the word and by faith believe and obey it. Those are the ones who are blessed, not his mother. How more clear could it be? How more clear could it be? Jesus disavowed any notion that a family relationship with him carried any special spiritual privileges, including his mother. Beloved, beloved, you're all listening, right? Good. I want you to listen to this. The blessing of God comes through his written word, not through Mary. And Jesus made clear that when it came to his public ministry, it was he, not Mary, who was in charge. Look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. These are all just framing thoughts here. John chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Notice how she is called the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God. Verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. She came to Jesus and was suggesting that he needed to do something about the situation. And Jesus made plain, woman, you are not in charge here. I am. And rather than someone going to Mary and prevailing upon Mary to to get Jesus to do what they want done, Mary tells the servants, you do whatever Jesus tells you to do. This is a complete reversal of Catholic teaching. Mary had no special privileges. That is contrary to everything that Catholics say. Now, let's quickly go through the five-part refutation of the things that we outlined earlier. First of all, Now, these are just going to parallel the first points. The Catholic teaching is now a biblical response, and we're just paralleling the points. First of all, Mary was not sinless. Mary was not sinless. You know what? Even though she was the mother of the Messiah, she needed salvation just like you and I do. And she made that plain with her own lips. Go back to Luke chapter 1 with me. Luke chapter 1. Far from being a co-mediator with Christ, what did Mary say in response to the news that she would give him birth? In verse 46, Luke 1, verse 46, Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. She says, I am rejoicing in God my Savior. Why would she need a Savior if she was sinless? She needed a Savior because she was sinful. And by calling God her Savior, Mary acknowledges her own sin. And beloved, that is consistent with other more general passages in Scripture that talk about the universality of sin in the human race. Let me remind you of Romans 3, verse 10 through 12, and listen to see if there's any room to squeeze in an exception for Mary. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Mary says, God, my Savior, the one who redeems me from sin. Scripture says there's not one that's good, that does right, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have to rewrite the key passages of Scripture to introduce an exception for Mary. You know, Scripture, by the way, Scripture is very clear, isn't it, to protect the sinlessness of Christ, repeatedly saying that there was no deceit found in His mouth, that He was without sin. Scripture says that over and over again. If Scripture had intended us to believe that about Mary, certainly, and if that was going to be a core of what we believe, certainly Scripture would have done for Mary what it did for Christ. It didn't do it for Mary because it wasn't true of Mary like it was true of Christ. Secondly, Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Her virginity only lasted until the birth of Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. 
Drop down to verse 24. Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now look, beloved, Scripture is speaking in somewhat delicate ways, making it plain that that her virginity only lasted until the birth of Christ. It was before they came together, indicating that at at some point in time they came together. They came together in marital intimacy. Verse 25, he kept her a virgin not permanently, not throughout the course of their entire marriage, but only until after she had given birth. And then their married life was like what any other biblical marriage should have been. Listen, if Mary had withheld herself from Joseph in intimacy, she would have been sinning against God to do so. As 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5 makes clear, the wife does not have authority over her body, but it belongs to her husband. Stop depriving yourselves. The whole command in marriage is that the husband and wife would be engaged in intimacy together. If Mary was a perpetual virgin, she sinned against God and against Joseph in doing so. The truth of the matter is she wasn't. Now, there's other ways to see this. There's another way to approach this. Scripture in multiple places refers to the brothers of Jesus, the brothers of Jesus. Look at Matthew 12. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 46. I'm only going to read one passage here. I've got four in my notes. Matthew 12, 46. Once again, you find, the, notice, notice the way that Jesus deals with his family members. Verse 46, while he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother." There again, you see this, this reference to obedience being the mark of a true relationship to Christ in the spiritual realm. But notice that Scripture refers to the brothers of Jesus. Now, what is a brother except someone who shares a parent with you? Jesus was not born from the seed of Joseph. He was born of Mary. So how is it possible for him to have brothers except that Mary had given birth to a slew of them in the years that followed the birth of Jesus. Matthew thirteen fifty five says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Brothers and sisters galore, they had a huge family. You don't get a huge family if you never engage in marital intimacy, beloved. Hope that's not a shock to anybody. I just realized, whoa, whoa, where? That's what happens? You see, now how do Catholics get around that? They say that, well, this word means cousins. The Scripture is just referring to the cousins of Jesus, and it's been mistranslated as brothers. You know what? That doesn't work. The word brother in English, you know what it means in Greek? It means brother. Sometimes it's used in a broader sense, like we use brother in a broader sense. You know, we talk about being brothers and sisters in Christ and all of that. Here's the killer for their weak defense of their defenseless position. There is a biblical word for cousin, and it's used in Colossians 4.10. The biblical writers had a word available in their vocabulary to describe cousins, and they didn't use it. They used the word brothers. Why? Because Jesus had many half-brothers and half-sisters who were born to Mary. 
Scripture uses the word brother because they had a common mother. And I don't want to be indelicate, but if Jesus had brothers, Mary did not remain a virgin after his birth. And therefore, everything that the Catholic Church says and builds up about her perpetual virginity is an absolute falsehood when measured by the teaching of Scripture. Subparagraph C, Mary was not assumed into heaven. I'll treat this quickly. There is no scriptural warrant for the idea that Mary was assumed to heaven at the end of her life. There's nothing in the Bible about that. Genesis 3.19 says, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Romans 5.12 says, Death spread to all men because all sinned. Scripture says that believers are awaiting the resurrection of their body, and Mary is waiting for the resurrection just like the rest of us, as do all saints who die. This is a complete fabrication made up as recent. In the course of some of your lifetimes, in 1950, they made this up, saying that it was something that they had always believed. That's the way they do it. The level of deception and the the lies and just the misrepresentation of basic facts of history is appalling to me, but they, they declare a dogma in 1950 that Mary was assumed into heaven and say, well, this is what we've always believed. Well, if you've always believed it, why didn't you say it before now? It's because you're making it up. And beloved, when things are made up, they're false. And things that are false are not true. And and when a a so-called system of salvation is based on what is false, it is a false salvation, which means it is no salvation at all, which means that they are still in their sins, destined for perdition unless they repent and, and forsake all of this mariolatry and all of this false religion and embrace Christ alone for their salvation. This matters. These things have eternal consequence. If it was just about winning an argument, we would have closed things up a long time ago. Fourthly, Mary is not the mother of God, and she is not the mother of the church. Let me just say it this way. I've made this point before. Whenever there is confusion about the person of Christ, it is almost always tied to the fact that people have confused the fact that Jesus was one person with two natures. You must remember the two natures of Christ. He is fully God, eternal deity, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And since His incarnation, He is now fully man His deity took on humanity in His incarnation. Beloved, just remember this. His human nature had no father. Joseph was His legal father, but not His biological father. In like parallel, His divine nature had no mother. Suggesting that the mother existed prior to the one at stake. Every one of you came after your mother, right? Mary refers to her lowly state in Luke 1.48. Her state was humble. She was a servant. She was not an exalted being. She certainly was not the mother of deity in the sense of the divine nature of Christ. She gave birth to his human nature. He was the God-man, but the Scripture repeatedly calls her the mother of Jesus, never the mother of God. Furthermore, Mary is not the church's mother. She had nothing to do with your salvation or mine. She is a part of the church, But she had nothing to do with the communication of grace to our souls. She had nothing to do with our regeneration. She had nothing to do with our redemption. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're getting close to finished here. We'll be out before midnight. And beat the timing of the Apostle Paul when Eutychus fell asleep and fell out the window. (laughs) 
Good old Paul. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. This is after the ascension of Christ. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. She's there as one of the body of believers not over them. They're not praying to her. They're not seeking her. They're not, they're not adoring her and kissing her feet. She's there as one. She's there as part of the church, not as the mother of the church. Well, finally, fifth and finally, Mary is not the co-mediator with Christ. Mary is not the co-mediator with Christ. Beloved, and it is a satanic blasphemy to say that she is. What does Scripture say? You can just jot down these Scripture references as I read them. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, says there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. One mediator, not two. Only one. Once again, we come to this point that I made last week talking about the one sacrifice of Christ. Beloved, if you can count to one, you can refute the entire system of Roman Catholicism. They say Mary is a co-mediator. You say, no, there's only one. Jesus, that excludes all others. In John 14, verses 13 and 14, remember the Catholics say, oh, go to Mary, pray to Mary. She'll, uh, She'll exercise her motherly charms on her son. No. In John 14, verses 13 to 14, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. There is an invitation from from Christ. Come to me directly. And he commands you. He sets forth an order of prayer that says, you are to pray in my name and in my name alone, not in the name of his mother. If you want to remember another thing to forbid the idea of praying to Mary, go to the most basic thing in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, pray then in this way. And what does he say? Our Father. Who do you address in prayer? God the Father, you ask in the name of the Son. There is no room for Mary to intrude upon that. And the real Mary, the true biblical Mary, would have none of it either. Under no circumstances could Mary fulfill the role of a redeemer or one who answers prayer. Acts 4.12, and speaking of Christ, says there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. I come back to what I said last week about refuting the Catholic Mass. After a period of time, you realize you're just shooting fish in a barrel. You can't miss. Beloved, the greatest... Most important thing that you could urge upon your Catholic friends is not to listen to these messages, although I think they would be helpful if they would listen to them. Call them, call them to read the Bible for themselves because most of them never crack open a Bible. You certainly don't need it in a Catholic Mass. Call them to read the Bible. The converting power of God is released through the Scriptures. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Call them to read the 66 books of the Bible, read the Gospels for themselves. That's where the power of God will be found to convert their souls. And so, beloved, let's summarize this on this co-mediator thing. I'm almost done. It is an error of infinite proportions for Catholicism to suggest that Mary shared in the sufferings of Christ. 
you have to think through this. Did, did Mary suffer as she was watching her son being crucified? Did she suffer? Yes, she probably suffered in her heart. It was painful for her to watch the one that she had nurtured from birth to be dying like that. But make a clear distinction in your mind about the sufferings of Mary and the sufferings of Christ. Mary's suffering was one of compassion as her human son was crucified. But beloved, when we talk about the sufferings of Christ, it has nothing to do with that. Mary's suffering at the cross of compassion has nothing to do with the utterly unique nature of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. What was Jesus doing on the cross? He wasn't suffering compassion. He was suffering the wrath of God poured out on him for the sins of everyone who would ever believe in him. And and listen, Catholics talk about Mary offering up her son to God at that time. No, no, we don't go there. We do not go there because the Bible says that Jesus offered up himself. He was both the offering and the one who made the offering. Mary did not offer Christ up. Christ offered up himself Christ suffered for sin. Mary knew nothing of enduring the wrath of God on behalf of sinners. Christ actually died as the payment for sin. That was part of his suffering. Mary didn't die when she stood at the foot of the cross. You see, there's no comparison. But by a deft confusion of terms, And combining into one things that should be kept separate, the Catholic Church says Mary suffered at the cross. Do you not understand? I'm asking this to the Catholic Church, not to you. Do you not understand the first thing about the sufferings of Christ on the cross? That he endured eternal divine wrath in his, in his body? And you're saying that Mary endured that? No, she didn't. You know, Think about it this way. You might be alongside someone who is suffering in a hospital bed, racked by pain of cancer or something like that. And you feel sympathy and it hurts your heart to be there watching it. Well, understand that 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 compassion, that's great, but you're not experiencing the same pain as the one going through it. You have an emotional pain, but you are not going through the physical pain in the same way they are. To a much infinite greater degree, when Christ was suffering the wrath of God on the cross, Mary had no part in that and therefore had no part in what is properly called the sufferings of Christ. So, what can we say about this? I'll close with a couple of quotes. R.C. Sproul said this in his book, Are We Together? He said, The biggest issue in the whole Mariology debate is the sufficiency of Christ. Is Christ alone our perfect sacrifice? Does he offer himself for the sins of his people, or is he offered by his mother? Does he alone achieve our redemption, or does he have to depend upon the cooperation of his mother? End quote. To ask those questions is to answer them. And he asked them well. Regarding prayers to Mary, Lorraine Bettner asks this. And think about this. (laughs) Think about this. And I quote this great theologian to whom I owe a significant debt in my life. Remember what we said. Catholics teach their people to pray to Mary. And this happens repeatedly millions of times each day, praying to Mary. Think about it. Think about what that means. Bettner asks this, how can any one of the perhaps 100 million practicing Roman Catholics throughout the world who desire Mary's attention 
Imagine that she can give him that attention during his prayers to her, while at the same time she is giving attention to all others who are praying to her, attending to her duties in heaven, conducting souls to heaven, and rescuing souls from purgatory. The average Roman Catholic acts on the assumption that Mary has the powers of deity, end quote. Remember, Mary is a human. She's not God. She doesn't have the powers of infinite omniscience, infinite awareness. She's a creature. How on earth could it possibly make any sense to think that she could hear the prayers of hundreds of millions given to her simultaneously. Think about it. Those of you that have more than one kid, two or three kids start talking to you at once, it's enough to, it's enough to make you crazy. Wait, 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 just stop one at a time, please. You can't process three kids talking to you at once. Where on earth does anyone think that Mary can hear 100 million prayers simultaneously? The ultimate outcome of Catholic doctrine is that they will make Mary another member of the Godhead. I'm not the first person to suggest that. It's the only way that you could make their system work. And you would have to do this. To make the Roman Catholic system work, you take a Bible and you throw it away. That's the only way you can get to Roman Catholicism. So, is Mary worthy of veneration? Does she help save our souls? I made five points. No, 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 no. If you entrust your soul to Mary, you are denying Christ and you will efface eternal judgment in the end. Christ alone is the hope of sinners. Friends, have you come to Christ alone for your salvation? Through Even through a message like this, he would extend his hands and call you to come to him because he receives everyone who turns from sin and comes to him for the salvation of their souls. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we ask you to rescue countless numbers from that wicked system of religion that we've examined again this evening. We ask you to have mercy on their souls. We thank you that you've had mercy on ours. Father, we rejoice in the fact that in Christ, we truly do have the one mediator, the one true redeemer, the one who can truly deliver us from sin, the one who will never let us go, the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, while it's been so distasteful to consider these teachings on Mary from Catholicism, it is a great blessing to turn away from that and to look up to our to the one true Redeemer, to Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, to Christ, the Mighty One of Jacob, to Christ, the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, to Christ and to Christ alone, O God, we commit our souls. We bow down and worship you through him. And we thank you for that redemption, that forgiveness of sin, which is found in Christ Jesus and in him alone. Bless us now as we go. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. That's Don Green here on The Truth Pulpit. And here's Don again with some closing thoughts. Well, my friend, before we go after today's uh, broadcast, I just want to invite you to look me up on Facebook, Don Green on Facebook. I often make original posts. I make comments about ministry and other matters of biblical importance there that do not make their way into this broadcast. And so if you are on Facebook, I invite you to join me. Look for Don Green and join us on Facebook for another way to connect with our ministry. That's Don Green, founding pastor of Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
Thank you so much for listening to The Truth Pulpit. Join us next time for more as we continue teaching God's people God's Word.